I don't think I could get more excited. It's been peak excitement in my heart this week as we've been thinking about what on earth am I here for. So hold on to your seats. I believe God's got an encouraging word for us this morning. You know, throughout this campaign, we are discovering or rediscovering answers to three of life's biggest questions. And whether people are Christians or not, whether you've stepped foot in a church before or not, or you've been invited here today, you know, lots of the questions that we ask, maybe not verbally, but we think, really can boil down to these three big questions, which are, (laughs) why am I alive? Does my life matter? And what is my purpose? And so they're they're common questions that are true for all of us that we ask at one time or another. And as Pastor Bill said, uh, we are kicking off today is day one of the What on Earth Am I Here For campaign. And so, yeah, read the first chapter of your book. There's one chapter per day for the next 42 days. And after you've read the first few pages of that, you can open it up and on there, there's a little QR code. If you have a smartphone, you can scan that on the picture setting. It'll take you to a link to hear another message. So you can listen to Rick for 42 days straight. Pastor Rick Warren, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Um, And then obviously in our groups, we're going to be listening to uh, the sessions that he has also recorded. So he is the author, Rick Warren, um, pastor of Saddleback Church, is the author of What on Earth Am I Here For book. And also a fantastic Bible teacher and and church leader right across the world. So we're going to learn heaps as we dig into this together. But I was thinking this week about anchor verses, Anchor verses or life verses, you know, verses that you come back to time and time again because they're just things that you stake your lives on. Promises that God has spoken to you or made very real and personal to you from the Bible, but then that you come back to because you think, you know, this is true and I need to hold on to this. It's like an anchor for me when I'm going through a really tricky time. And maybe you're going through a really tricky time at the moment. Anchor verses. An anchor Bible verse for so many is Romans 8, 28. And on your seats, there are some message notes, which you can now take out. Because like Pastor Bill said, part of um, reinforcing what what we're learning and discovering throughout this campaign is also recording and writing down what God's speaking to us about. And so there's some parts in that that have intentionally been left blank, This is not homework, (laughs) Um, but this is an opportunity for you to actually write down and note the things that you're hearing. So ushers, if you could quickly jump up. If you need a pen right now, put up your hand and our ushers will run to you and give you a pen and uh, you can follow along with us that way. An anchor verse for so many, an anchor Bible verse is Romans 8, 28. Maybe it's some of yours. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And usually we stop at that bit and that bit, even just on its own, is awesome. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. You know, that's an anchor verse for my dad, who, you know, when he lost his wife, my mum, when she took her own life, this was an anchor verse for him. It's something that he kept coming back to that gave him hope. We know that in all things, not all things that happen to us in life are crash hot. Some of them are pretty horrible, right? Some of them are downright evil. I'm thinking if you've been abused or there's been, you know, injustice that has happened to you. Some of the things in our life are not good, but it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good. And then the bit that sometimes we forget to remember, (laughs) the good of those who love him, the bit that sometimes we forget to remember is who have been called according to his purpose. Who have been called according to his purpose. So he can bring good out of even bad for those who love him. This is such an amazing promise. But to, to actually also stake our lives upon the last bit for those who have been called according to his purpose is true and it's powerful because calling and purpose go together. Calling and purpose go together and that's why I'm so excited about these messages because each one is about you have been called to. The Bible talks about purpose but about 10 times more than the Bible uses the word purpose and calling actually does refer to your purpose but more than 10 times than, than it uses the word purpose, it uses the word calling. Calling and purpose go together. And that's what we're going to look at together for the next six weeks. So what do you think of when you hear the word call? 
When I think of the word call, I think of a phone. Someone calling me, someone ringing me or texting me when I'm trying to do something else. <laughs> someone calling me with, you know, things that they'd like me to do or interruptions, choosing not to take a call when it's family dinner time, you know, the call. <laughs> Let's say the phone rings one day and you thought that this is an interruption or it's going to be bad news because sometimes we do get that on our phones. But somebody was calling to tell you you had just inherited $50 million. Would you want to take that call? Young people, yes, you would. Yes, you would. (laughs) What if God called you? What if he personally rang you and said, Gina, I have an assignment for you. (laughs) And I designed you specifically to fulfill it. Well, the Bible says that you have already been called. You have been called according to his purpose. What does that mean? Well, the word calling in the Greek word, I'm not going to say it, but the word calling means God is calling you. Hello, like he called Samuel. Personally, (laughs) calling is about your assignment in life, your purpose, your mission in life. The reason God created you, that's your calling. So you might have heard people talk about that before. What is a calling? Calling, what is that about? Well, that's what it's about. It's God's assignment, God's personal Invitation to you to live out his purpose for your life. The Latin word for calling is one that you may have heard. It's vocation. Vocation. That's the Latin word for calling. Vocation comes from the Latin word voce or vocare. It means to speak. It means to call. And from this Latin word, we get the word vocal. And vocalise comes from this word. So it's, it's something that's spoken out. So your vocation and your calling are the same thing. But the thing is, in our society and in our culture, we've reduced and minimised the word vocation down to mean your job. But your calling is far, far, far more significant than your job or your career because your job and your career will change. You might have a job in one season and then you finish that job and then you get another job. As parents, if you're a stay-at-home parent, some, you parent for a season and then your kids usually, hopefully, that's the goal, move out <laughs> and pursue their own calling. Vocation is far, far more than just your career. Your calling is not your career. It's more than a specific season or one field of work. You may have a job, but your vocation is your calling in life. It's time to reclaim that word, I reckon. Do you know the Bible is full of God calling people? Personally, rocking up in their life, arranging circumstances, getting their attention and saying, I've got something for you to outwork my purposes. God calling Abraham and Abraham responding. God calling Moses for a purpose in his life and Moses responding. God calling Deborah and Esther for a unique period, for such a time as this, to live out his purposes. God calling Nehemiah, who was a builder. God calling Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea and Joel. God calling David and Solomon. He calling Joshua and Rahab and Ruth and Elijah. Just think about some of the stories. If you know any of the stories of those people, they're varied and vast, but over it all is God's call. In the New Testament, God calling a fisherman named Peter, a businesswoman named Lydia, and a number of Marys. There's a number of Marys, quite a few. (laughs) There's Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's Mary, a woman who was oppressed and delivered from demons. What about God calling a murderous scholar named, religious scholar named Saul, and he has such a radical encounter with the risen Christ that he even changes his name, becomes a follower of Jesus, and becomes who we know as the Apostle Paul. God used 
Saul, turn him into Paul wildly, far dramatically beyond what he could have imagined. God has a call on every person's life, every person, young people here today. God made you for himself. He didn't make you just for you. He made you for himself. He's got a plan. He's got an assignment. He's got a calling. And he designed and crafted you specifically to fulfill it. This prayer the Apostle Paul prays in Ephesians 1 is actually a prayer that our senior leadership team and our congregational pastors that we're praying as we launch into this campaign. In Ephesians 1 it says, My prayer is that light will flood your hearts and that you will understand the hope that was given to you when God called you. Then you will discover the glorious blessings that will be together be yours together with all of God's people. And you might be thinking here, well, God wouldn't call me. You might be thinking, well, if I got a call from God, I don't even know what I would say. (laughs) But the Bible doesn't say if God calls you. He said when. When God calls. It's not if. It's not even a question of if because He's called every human being because He wanted you to come into existence. He wanted you to be born on planet Earth. He decided the world needed a little bit of Sarah input. And so He designed her and He crafted her and created her and said, I want her to be born in this time, in this season, for this purpose, for my glory. Sarah, love you. Thanks for letting me use you as an example. Not if. Chuck if out. When? When? <laughs> But the real question is, do you want to hear what he's got to say and what he's asking you to do? It's not if, it's when. And, and when he calls, have you got an ear to hear what it is that he's saying? Do you know Pastor Barry Silverback, our International Missions Director, I always remember him. He preached a message called The Cost and the Call of Ministry. And he talked about a time when he he'd moved to PNG. There was like nothing. It was back six of... PNG. Um, <laughs> no running water, nothing. He was just like feeling so frustrated because there wasn't any fruitfulness that he could see right at that point. He's like, that's it. I've had it. I'm done. God, if you've called me to be a missionary, this sucks. I've had enough. That's it. He had a like a mini tanty, which we sometimes have. And it makes me feel so much better that Pastor Barry had one of them. <laughs> but he had a moment where Jesus clearly spoke to him and said, when you gave your life to me, did you mean it? And he said, yeah. Well, he said, well, you don't even have the right of choice to quit because your life belongs to me now. Pretty, I mean, do we understand his right and his claim to our life when we give it over to him? Do we understand that? Are we ready to acknowledge it? Do you know, I think when we know God's kind intentions and the goodness of his will and his plan for us, we want to do that. We want to say, yes, Lord, have my life, all of it. When we know that his will is actually also his very best for us, we can't help but say yes to his plan. And for some of you, I just really felt this next verse I'm going to put up on the screen It's going to be an aha moment for you. It's going to be an aha moment. I believe the Holy Spirit is going to flood your heart with light so you can see and grasp this truth for yourself. Are you ready? All right, let's put it up. Next one, guys. In his love. Not that one. That's okay. I'm just going to keep going. In his love. Listen to me. Don't look at the screen. He chose us in Christ... It says he actually selected us for his own. Actually, it's on your handout. Praise God. In his love, he chose us in Christ. He actually selected us for himself as his own. He actually selected you for himself as his own. Before, when, the foundation of the world. That's crazy. We can't get our head around that. That's amazing. So that we will be holy, that is consecrated, set apart for him, purpose-driven and blameless in his sight. He predestined and lovingly planned 
for you to be adopted to himself as his own child or for all of us as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will. The kind intention and good pleasure of his will. His will for you is not to harm you. It's not to contain you. It's not to put a restrictive load upon you. His will actually is, comes out of his kind intention towards you. It comes out of his desire to bless you and to use you to be a blessing. And I think if, when we question that, or when our trust capacity has been broken or damaged, it can be hard for us to accept that God has kind intentions towards us, that his will for us is good. And so we can find it hard to really, you know, we don't understand the whole big picture and so we try and work it all out ourselves. But when we understand that, I'm going to read it again. In his love, he chose, and you can put your own name in there, he chose me in Christ. He actually selected me for himself as his own before the foundation of the world so that I would be holy, that is consecrated, set apart for him, purpose-driven and blameless in his sight. He predestined and lovingly planned for me to be adopted to himself as his own child through Jesus Christ in accordance with. It all came out of this, the kind intention and good pleasure of his will towards you. Isn't that beautiful? How do you know that? How do you know that God is kind towards you? How do you know it? Like some people think God is just... As Pastor Bill said, a celestial Santa Claus handing out good things. Good, good on you, Michael. You're a, good on you. Here's a little something for you. Some people think God's an angry judge, ready to hand out punishment for all the things that you've done wrong. And one little wrong step, that's it. No second chance for you. I mean, how do we know that his intentions towards us are kind and good? Well, we know that because he sent Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus is God's kindness and God's love revealed. If you want to know what God thinks about you, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God feels about you and what he intends for you, you look at him strung up on a cross, taking your sin and all the things that separated you from God, all your wrongdoing, all your wrong thinking, that only he knows about and taking it on himself. And he was crucified because he took God's punishment. He took God's wrath. He took God's anger at all the things you've ever done wrong. He took it. Jesus took it in your place so you wouldn't have to. That's his kind intention towards you. If you're ever questioning if God's for you, you look at the cross. You keep, we, that's why we talk about it so much at this church. So we keep coming back to it is because the cross of Christ reveals the love and the kindness of God on our behalf. The cross of Christ, He reveals it. It's, it's, it demonstrates it once and for all time. It's like a, a shouting it from the rooftops. He's kind towards you because Jesus died for you. He laid down his life for you. He willingly sacrificed himself on a cross. Though he had done no wrong, he became sin for you and for me. He was buried in a grave and after three days, he rose again from the dead. The God that we worship and proclaim from this church and from this platform week after week is a risen saviour. He was a crucified Christ and he's a risen saviour. And he's alive and he wants to bring anyone and everyone into a relationship with God as they put their trust not on trying to be good, not trying to earn brownie points, not trying to impress God, not trying to keep up appearances before God, but go, you know what? I can't bridge the gap, but you're holy, I'm not. I need a loving God who laid down his life for me and I'm willing to put my trust in Jesus because you are the way to God. That's his kind intention toward you. That's why you can put your life in his hands, young people, grown up people, <laughs> and keep coming back to doing that. It's because his intention toward you is so kind, so merciful, so good. He sent Jesus. 
I just really felt in preparation for this message that there were some people here who your capacity to trust has been damaged or broken. I don't know what's happened in your life. Maybe someone's let you down. Maybe there's been intense trauma in your life through no fault of your own. Maybe there's been betrayal, deep hurt. I don't know what. I just really felt I had a picture when I was praying of this, this cord that was just severed. It was cut. And I felt like God was just saying to some of you here that your trust capacity feels like that. You're like, I really want to trust God with my whole life, but it feels like... I just, I don't know if I can. I'm assuming because the room's gone quiet, that's resonating with some of you. I just feel like the Lord wants you to know that, that he can do anything. That he can actually renew your trust. Because he's the one who'll never break your heart or never let you down. I think some of you, if you, that re- resonates for you, you think it, your trust, your ability to trust has been irreparably damaged. No, it's not. God is a healing God and he can put the pieces back together. I just felt for anyone here, we're going to just pray right now, pause and just pray for that. So if there's anyone here, that's for you. No one else is looking around, but just as a sign, a little crack of I'm wanting to trust you, God. I find it hard, but I'm wanting to. You can just open your palms up before God, just palms up before him. Say, God, I need you to do a healing work in my life. Because he can. He did it in my life. I I know he can do it. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you for every person here. Lord, I know that that is just uh, a word from you today because you want to lift people up. You want to restore people's souls. You want to rebuild their capacity to trust. And Lord, where it feels like something's been irreparably damaged, we just say, no, it hasn't. Because Jesus, you are the one who can bring the dead back to life. You were raised from the dead yourself. And so, Lord, we just ask you now to just come in and do a healing work and rebuild. And my precious brothers and sisters, rebuild their capacity to trust. Lord, rebuild them. Give them a gift of faith. Help them now, we pray. Just do a healing work through these 40 days in their life, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to smash through this. You ready? Get your notes ready. I'm going to give you eight things you need to know about God's call on your life. And I'm literally going to smash through them. So get ready, take notes. Here we go. The first thing is it's a gift. It's a gift. Your calling, my calling is a gift from God. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't work for it. You don't bargain for it. You don't get brownie points for it. It's just a flat out gift of God's grace. And it comes to us when we, get, when we give our lives over to Jesus, when we give our hand, lives into his hand, salvation comes with your calling. Your calling comes with salvation, so I should say. It's a gift of grace. <laughs> Galatians 1.6 says, God by his grace through Christ has called you to become his people. By his grace. Grace is the fact that God knows every dumb mistake that you and I are going to make and he still chose to create us. He knew all the times we were going to disobey him and he still chose to create us. That is the grace of God. The fact is God knows all the things I've done, even when I've thought I could run my own life just fine without him. He knows that. And you know what he keep relentlessly saying through the kindness that we see in Jesus? I love you, 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 I love you. No buts. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. No clarifying statements. I love you. Your calling to Christ is also the calling to your purpose. In 2 Timothy 1.9 it says, He has saved us and called us, they go together, to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of His own purpose and grace. His own purpose and grace. God's call on your life, it's a gift. Number two, 
It's for God's purpose. God did not make you for you. He called you for a purpose. God's calling is about His plan for your life, not your plan. His dream for my life, not my dream. His purpose, not your parents' purpose or your boyfriend's purpose or your, or your husband or wife's purpose. It's actually God's purpose for your life. There's a reason why He created you and put you on planet, planet Earth and it's far greater even than marriage. God's purpose. You were made by God and for God. And Pastor Rick Warren says, until you understand that life is never going to make sense. Never. A good example of this is the story of Jacob and Esau in the Bible. In Romans 9 it says, before the two boys, Esau and Jacob were born, it was always the firstborn who got the, the you know, got all the stuff, got the inheritance, got the favour, got the blessing, got the, you're the firstborn, you're awesome. And then, yeah, we're glad you're here too, to number two. All right, that's what the culture was. But God flipped it around because he wanted to. And he said, God told their mum, Rebecca, the older will serve the younger. Totally contrary to culture at that time. And this was before the boys had done anything good or bad. God said this so that the, the one chosen would be chosen because of God's own plan. In Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are God's workmanship, His masterpiece. You know that word workmanship in the Greek? It actually means His poem. Nathan, you're His poem. Isn't that awesome? God writes a poem with your life. It's beautiful. God's poem created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Number one, it's a gift. Number two, it's for God's purpose, not your own. Number three, God already planned it before I was born. God already planned it before I was born. In Galatians 1.15, it said, It pleased God in His kindness, there's that word again, kindness, to choose me and call me even before I was born. What undeserved mercy. Can you say amen to that? I'm going to invite my friend Emily to come up here. Where are you, Em? She's a legend. If you didn't know, Emily's having her first baby. How exciting. And we are going to use Emily as a prop for learning our memory verse. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> All right, so look at her. Look at this beautiful baby that's going. Only God knows. They don't even know what, whether they're having a boy or a girl, right? Yeah, we do. You do now? Oh, they're having a boy. Woo! <laughs> Sorry, sorry to just declare that about everyone, but that's great. Um, so they're so excited. I've been journeying with Chris and Emily, her husband, and this is their first child and it's so beautiful. But what I want to do is I want you to remember this memory verse because you remember seeing Emily's beautiful belly with the baby growing in her womb, baby boy, that God already knows every step of this boy's life before he's going to be born. Like that makes me really emotional thinking about it. It's just amazing. God already knows. He already has planned out this baby's whole days. It's beautiful. And so we're going to learn our memory verse and we're going to use the who, what, where, when principle to learn our memory verse. So can we put our memory verse up on the screen? Week one memory verse is Isaiah. No, not that one. I know it's about a womb, but yep, that's good. This one, Isaiah 44.2 says, I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. This baby boy growing in Emily's womb is in God's care. Okay. Because it's a trust thing, right? It's a, it's a miracle how a baby grows. It's a miracle. And at the end, you just think, wow, God, how did you do that? That's amazing. It's a miracle. I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. All right, take that off the screen, please. We need it. Go. Thank you. All right, Isaiah 44.2. That's the hardest bit to learn. Can you say Isaiah 44.2? All right, and say it with a bit of guts. So, Isaiah 44, 2. Isaiah. All right, good. We're going to say that before the verse. So the first bit is the what, uh, sorry, is the who. The who, who, what, when, where. Remember I said that? Okay, the who. I am, that's the who, God. In the Bible, he's called the great I am, the one who has always existed, I am. I am, that's God, that's who. I am your creator. All right, that's who he is. That's the who. All right. Can you say, 
I am your creator. He is your creator, baby. All right. (laughs) I am your creator. Okay. The next bit is the what bit. The what is you. That's who God's talking to. I am your creator, you. All right, let's say that. I am your creator, you. All right, now do it to point to the person next to you when you get to you. Ready? I am your creator, you. All right, good. All right. Okay, the next is the where. Where is Emily's baby right now? Okay, it's in her womb. So I am your creator. You were in my care. Her baby's in God's care. You were in my care. Okay, that's the where. That's the when, sorry. No, that's the where. Thank you, I'm getting confused. Too many words. All right. I am your creator. You were in my care. Can we do that? Go. I am your... You can do that if it helps you remember. You know, pretend that you've got a pregnant belly. That's okay. Let's try that again. Ready? (laughs) Michael, come on. (laughs) I'm your, I've done kids' camps, all right? So there we go. I'm your creator. Uh, we're in my... All right. And this is the when, even before you were born. All right? Let's put it all together. Ready? I am your creator. You were in my care, even before you were born. Isaiah, what? Woo! Good job. Thank you, Emily. Put it back up on the screen. I want you to test each other at home this week. Just say, what's a merry verse? Quick. Or, and, or take out a verse and or take out a word and get them to practice it. It's good. You do have to do it to yourself. That's right. You can just. Good, Shirley. Just get in front of the mirror. Speak it out into your life. Very good. Number, th- number four, my sins and mistakes don't change it. You might think you've blown it. I really feel this is for some of you today, that somehow God's disappointed in you because you've stuffed up too many times. Let me tell you, because His call on your life is a gift, your mistakes and your sins don't change it. Praise God. How good is that? The expression of it may change, the timing and the season may change, the outworking of it may change, but God's call remains on your life, always unchanged forever. So good. Remember we talked about the prayer that Paul prayed, that you might understand the hope to which he called you. And this is part of the wonderful hope that you can have, that your sins and mistakes don't change God's call on your life. This is for some of you. God doesn't make junk. And Jesus didn't die for junk. And God's saying to you today, I want you to stop agreeing with the devil. Because that's what he says about you. That's not what God says about you. God doesn't make junk. And Jesus didn't die for junk. His death and resurrection on your behalf mean God will never stop loving you. He's never disappointed in you. His anger at your sin, his punishment for your sin went on Jesus. And it's nailed to the cross. God will never write you off. He'll never push you away and flick you away. Isn't that beautiful? For some people here today, this message, God wants you to know that the call he has on your life, it's still current. It's still current. It hasn't expired. It hasn't passed its use by date. It's still current. Praise God. What a mercy. Maybe for some of you, that means it's time to come back to him with all your heart and rededicate your life. When you see his kindness, you're like, yeah, man, I I actually want to live my whole life for him. Do you know, Romans 5 says, sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death and Jesus has already risen from the dead and we get to spend forever in eternity with him. Praise God. And that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, Jesus, invites us into life. And that life goes on and on, world without end. Number one, it's a gift. Number two, it's for God's purpose. Number three, God already planned it before you were born. Number five, your sins and mistakes don't change it. Number six, am I up to? 
Oh, number four. Yeah, number five. It's permanent. <laughs> Romans 11 says God's gifts and His calling are irrevocable. They can never be withdrawn. Why is this important to know? Because the enemy of our souls will lie to us and say, you've blown it. Come, come and kick you when you're feeling down or unwell or through various circumstances and it looks like His call has stalled or you feel like drawing back or giving up. God's gifts and His call can never be withdrawn. Nothing and no one can thwart them. So don't believe the lies that come your way. Choose not to focus on your fears or your inability or the many, many reasons why there's discouraging or intimidating things coming at you. Focus again on Jesus. Feed your faith and trust in God. Think about and throw yourselves upon his faithfulness and he's promised the one who has called you is faithful and he will do it. He will do it. Consider him again. Reflect deeply on what he endured on the cross and how he chose to not give up, but resolutely set his face, determined to outwork God's plan. And who benefited? Countless upon countless millions who've received Christ. Trillions probably. Think about who will benefit if you just stay at your post Trusting God to faithfully see you through. It could be hundreds, even if it's what just one. But it could be millions. Who knows? Don't give up. Don't give up. His call and his gifts, even when you can't see f the fruit that you're believing for, don't give up. It's irrevocable. It can never be withdrawn. Number six. It's connected to others. Hebrews 3.1 says, Brothers and sisters, you are holy partners in a heavenly calling. I always, when we hear the word partner, I'm sorry, but I always think American Texas accent. I'm not going to do it today, but so tempting. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you can do it to each other later. Brothers and sisters, you are holy partners in a heavenly calling. And the Bible talks about us being part of a body of a believers. You know, think about how amazing an an eyeball is or an eye, how it takes light and uh, does something. I don't know the science of it. Please help me if you're a scientist. <laughs> and, and we can see out of it. It's amazing. But you take an eye and you disconnect it from a body and it's just a little eye sitting out there. What does it do? It can't see anything. <laughs> it's the same with us. We've got to be connected with God's family to outwork God's call in our life. You actually cannot be disconnected and fully fulfill his call on your life. So how are you connecting with the people in this room? Just look around. They're magnificent. Do you need to take a little risk and stay a bit longer on a Sunday to have a conversation? Have you been holding out on joining a life group, but maybe God's saying, you know what? You need to do it. Do you need to tell someone what you've been struggling with? or offer to pray for someone and carry their burdens. How do you need to connect in a deeper way with someone in this room? How is God wanting to deepen your connections through this campaign? We're up to number seven. Number seven is God will empower me to live it out. Do you know that one of the worst things, and if you've ever said this, don't worry, because... I'm sure all of us have thought it or said it one time. We're like, God wouldn't give you more than you can handle. Yes, he would. Have you read the Bible? He gives everyone more than they can handle. <laughs> like that's the Christian life. The Christian life is you can't handle it, people. You can't do it on your own. You actually need a God and his resurrection power living in you to live the Christian life. God's always going to give you more than you can handle so that you can trust in his power. But it's not meant to be discouraging. <laughs> it's just like, of course he is. Of course he is because he takes ordinary people and does extraordinary things through them. That's the repeated story of the Bible over and over and over again. But 1 Thessalonians 1.11, the flip side of that is when God calls you, he will equip you. 
If he's called you to something, you have all the resources of heaven behind you. Rebecca, God has called you to Alice Springs, you and your family. You have all the resources of of heaven behind you as you serve in that place. And we pray for you. We love you. We bless you. You're part of our CFC family. Stay strong with that. I know you do, but it's just sometimes can be isolating, right? In 1 Thessalonians, it says, that is why we always pray for you, asking our God to help you live the kind of life he's called you to live. We pray that with his power, God will help you do the good things you want and perform the works that come from what? From your faith. They don't come from striving, they come from your trust in God, from your faith. God will empower you to live it out. If he's called you to it, and you're like, God, I know you've put me here. Sometimes that's the only thing that's helped me keep going. You know, breakout was at, at, a, at a point where it could have actually, we could have stopped it completely. There's a fire in my belly, something in my, the pit of my stomach. People determination, I think it might have been the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they said, no way. We are going to stick at this. We're going to rock up and just start, just keep sewing into this. Let's get Jill and Alan into this team. And then we started building into this core group of young people that now have become the team that are seeing amazing fruitfulness. It's just, and I'm not saying that to say it was me. I'm just saying that sometimes you know God's called you to something. You know it's part of his kingdom. You know it's an eternal purpose. And you just think, you know what? We are just going to stand our ground and believe that God is going to empower us to see a breakthrough. And number eight, the prize is worth it. Did you know who the prize is? We get to one day, if you've given your life to Christ, just think about this. You get to one day see Jesus face to face. Do you ever think about what that's going to be like? That's amazing. You get to see the one who died for you, probably well, still with the wounds in his wrists and the scars on his body. You get to see him face to face. It's amazing. So Paul says, I pressed on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, now we see only a dim likeness of things. It's as if we're seeing them in a foggy mirror. But someday we will face, we'll see face to face. What I know now is not complete, but someday, I love this, I will know completely just as God knows me completely now. So beautiful. That's the prize. That's the prize that one day we get to, you get to stand before Jesus. All of us do, whether we've confessed him or not. And the two things that he's going to ask us is, what have you done with my son, Jesus Christ? Have you embraced him? Have you given your life to him? Or have you rejected his offer of forgiveness and eternal life? The sad thing is God doesn't send people to hell. People willingly choose it for themselves. And he doesn't want that for any person. Hell is eternal separation from God and all that is good. But we're called to be with Jesus forever. What did you do with my son Jesus? And the second question he's going to ask us is, what have you done with the gifts and the talents and the time and the energy and the, the time in culture, that I, the, the location where I planted you, where I've called you, what have you done with that? Don't you want to be able to say, Jesus, I gave it a crack. <laughs> I had a go. Like I didn't get it perfect, but Jesus, I, I really wanted to live my whole life for you. I did the best I could. I know that you empowered me. I know I didn't get it perfect, but you know what? I had a go. I did the best I could. And to hear him say back to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Like, that's the prize. That is the prize. That is the prize that we know that this life is not all there is. And that one day we're going to stand before him. And so why don't we just take a moment now to talk with him, to ask him, to help us to live out his call on our life. Let's just do that now.
going to pray a prayer, and as I'm praying it, if you want to pray it too, just in your heart, say, that's me, God. That's my prayer. That's what I'm praying this morning. If you mean it with all your heart, he hears that. Here's the prayer. Dear God, I thank you that you created me. I'm not an accident. Thank you that I've been in your care even before I was born. Thank you that you not just created me, but you've called me. You have a purpose and assignment for my life. God, I'm not here on earth, this earth just to waste time. Thank you that you've called me. Even before you made the world, you called me for a purpose. God, I want your plan, not my plan. Thank you that your plan for me began from the moment of my birth. And even though I've made many mistakes and I've sinned and hurt others and others have hurt me, it hasn't changed your call on my life. Thank you that my calling is permanent. I realise today that I can't fulfil my purpose disconnected. I need to be connected to others in your body, others in your family with the same spirit and the same calling. Give me courage to do this. Give me humility to learn. To reach out and do life with others here in this room. I thank you, Lord, that you promised to give me the power to do what you've asked me to do. Thank you that you won't ask me to do something that you won't enable and strengthen me to do. It might be more than I can handle, but it's not going to be more than you can handle. Lord, the prize is worth it. Being able to stand before you face to face And acknowledge that I relied on you to live out your call. That's what I want. I want to live the rest of my life in such a way that I delight you. Knowing that one day I will share in your kingdom and in your glory. And if you're here today and you've never ever given your life to Jesus right now, just invite him to come in to your life now. Just ask him and he'll come in. You might want to say, Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for dying for me. I want to learn to love you and to trust you and to serve you because I've seen your kindness today. And I want to experience more of it. Thank you, Lord.